Hi, everyone. I'm Joshua Zabel, Chief Financial and Strategic Planning Officer for Minitab. Welcome to another premiere for the Statistical CFO. Today, we're talking back to basics. If you're watching this live and you have comments, feel free to comment live. For the rest of you watching on a recording at some point, I hope you enjoy it as well. So today we're talking some basic descriptive statistics. A lot of these terms you've almost definitely heard of. Um, you probably understand them to some extent, or maybe you understand all of them and it's just a refresher. But I'm hopeful that this presentation will help you get a stronger understanding of a lot of terms that get thrown around quite often, both in terms of what they really mean and the right context to use them. Before I get into the materials, just a little bit about myself and the webinar here or the premiere. Uh, this is for really anybody who uses KPIs. My finance background, I'll, I'll highlight some of those examples, but if you do look at data, this will be useful for descriptive statistics is applicable to across all data sets. Uh, and like I said, I'm going to hit the concepts you're familiar with. Uh, I've been at various companies, different sizes, Main Street, Wall Street, um, and I'm not a statistician. And that's really important here because these are basic statistics. So the, the elephant in the room is statistics anxiety. Statistics anxiety is a real thing. One of the reasons why many of us don't use statistics or shy away from it is because it makes us anxious. Uh, it makes us feel like we don't understand what's going on. Um, you can see there's real data that demonstrates it's a real thing. Uh, here's the good news. You shouldn't have statistics anxiety. Uh, we're here to help you one step at a time. Uh, we actually, me and a colleague wrote a blog about this uh, a, a couple of years back. But uh, stick with me here. I think hopefully by the end of this premiere, you'll have the confidence to not only deal with descriptive statistics, but maybe dive deeper into a little bit more advanced statistics. Okay, so descriptive statistics. So descriptive statistics can be a lot of things. I've defined a, a small set of descriptive statistics as defined by Minitab uh, when you run the menu and ask for descriptive statistics of a data set. So these are no way uh, the all encompassing list of descriptive statistics, but I think this is a really nice, helpful way to start. You can see here what they are. So I'm gonna address all the items you see below or, or at the on the screen. And hopefully some of these look familiar. And for those that don't, hopefully you'll learn a little bit today. So in order to get descriptive statistics, we have to have a data set, you can see on your screen, there is a data set. It's a pretty simple data set, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. You can also see the name of the data set, Central Tendency. That was the arbitrary name of it. Uh, and I'll talk about that in a second. Okay, so I took that data set and I ran it through Minitab using the basic statistics display descriptive statistics. And you can see the output below. And I'm going to spend time discussing the output. Okay, so let's start really easy. I talked about the data set, what we called it. In this case, that would be the variable, what we're talking about. The data set is some sort of piece of data that's describing something. It could be weight, which would be a bunch of people's weights, um, or temperature. In this case, I had a random name for the data set. That's named my data set. N, which you can see here is seven, is the number of observations in this data set. Uh, that's important because you got to know if you have a large data set or a small data set, uh, which gets into other more advanced statistical concepts, which I won't get into. But as you can imagine, the larger your data set, the more applicable some of the statistics are. N with a star here, in this case, in Minitab, reflects the number of missing values. And while N with a star may not be a universal term, I think the concept should be universal and should be thought of. When you collect your data, sometimes you have all the data, but sometimes you're missing some data. And depending on how much data you're missing, you might judge your data set differently. So for example, if I had an N of seven and an N star of seven, which would imply that I'm missing just as much data as I have, I really wouldn't put a lot of confidence behind my data set. 
Here's an example of a data set missing data. You can see height. Again, that would be the variable, the name of the data. And you can see here with the stars, those are two data I'm missing. So if I were looking at the height of people, let's say here, it's clear that I didn't collect the height of certain people. And again, depending on how much data you're missing could impact how good you feel about your data set or how good about you feel about the statistics about your data set. So we're going to take a little bit more advanced step and we're going to talk about mean or median. Now, mean or median are things most people have heard of uh, and most people use them in some way, shape or form. But I'm going to talk about a proper way to think about using them and argue why you actually should be using both of them most of the time. So let's just define them quickly. Uh, for those of you that need a refresher, mean is a fancy word for arithmetic average. I think most of us know how to calculate average. Uh, median, many of us also know, is the middle value. And I have in parentheses there if the observations are odd or even. Odd is pretty easy because it's the exact middle. If it's even, you actually have to take the average of the two middle values. That's often a uh, difficult question on a exam in high school for people. Uh, and you can see here the examples of the median, four, six, and eight, six would be the middle value, and then an even data set there. So let's talk about the pros and the cons of the mean versus the median. So the mean or the average really reflects the overall exposure, uh, but there is sensitivity to outliers. So if I have a data set that's, you know, two, 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 and then I have one piece of data that's 100, and I average that together, the average is going to be significantly higher than two. So that's a case where an outlier is really obfuscating what the true average is. The median, on the other hand, in that same type of data set, would show the typical case. So in that case, if I had two, 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 and 100, again, the median would be two, which is probably more representative of the data set I just said. Uh, but it would also hide the fact that you have an outlier that's 100. So there are pros and cons to using mean and median. If we look at a typical KPI that a lot of people in finance, and actually sales also might look at, we look at revenue per customer. So if you want to know your average customer size, you might have them use the mean if you're really using that data to forecast out what that average customer is. If I have five customers at an average of 100, I can forecast what type of revenue I have. If I really want to understand the typical customer, I might be better off using the median. Again, in that example I gave with all the twos and the 100, if I have two, 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 and 100, a two number is much closer to the typical revenue per customer than 100 is. In a finance example, we look at DSOs or day sales outstanding, which I'll refer to one of my other talks that I talked about control charts with DSOs. And so in DSOs, you typically use the average because you want to highlight a risk quickly. So in the case of the two, 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 and a hundred, even though the average would be much higher than two and maybe not truly representative of the data set, the average would immediately flag to me that something's going on with my DSOs which actually would lead me to dig into, find that outlier and say, what's going on here? In a median situation, I might want to understand the typical collection cycle. So again, going back to that data set with two, two, two and a hundred, it's more typical that I'm collecting in two days, not a hundred days, uh, which gives me a different answer. So here's a bright idea. Why don't we use both of them? Most of the time when we're looking at KPIs, we choose mean or median. We talk about average or median. Why aren't we using both? I just talked to you about the advantages and the pros and cons, and getting both is pretty easy to look at. That's why Minitab gives you both, because they both provide valuable information. So if you learn nothing else here, take away that where you're looking at the average, maybe you should look at the median too and vice versa. Okay, you might have seen something called the SE mean. And this is the warning. We're starting to dig into a little bit more deeper statistics here. So the SEME stands for standard error mean, which measures how much the sample is expected to vary from the true population. And why does that matter? Because you really want to know how good your average or your mean is. You want to understand the confidence intervals, 
and also the difference between the group means or meaningful if sampling is playing a role. Who cares? So one of the things you learn in statistics or data analysis is sometimes you can take the entire data set, which is called a population, and sometimes you take some sample of the data set. I'll give examples in a minute, but the SCME comes in play if you're taking the sample. So if you're taking the entire population, ignore it. But if you are taking a sample, this really tells you in layman's terms how good your mean is. So again, going back to you're going to look at a mean, you're going to look at a median. In the case that you're actually taking a sample, you want to know how good that mean is. And that's what standard error mean actually means. So here's a great example. Let's just say I want to know compliance around expense reports. Well, maybe there's 10,000 expense reports that I have to go through to look at to make an improvement here. So instead of looking through all 10,000 of those reports, I might sample 200 expense reports to collect to calculate things like missing receipts or reimbursement amounts or variance in spending by department. Well, in the case that I'm taking a sample here, it's important that I know the SE mean, because if I'm looking at different means of things, I want to understand how good that mean is. If I was taking all 10,000 of those reports or those expense reports, I don't really care about the standard error because I have the actual mean itself of the entire population. Here's an example where we, in DSOs, we use typically all the DSOs. And so standard error mean would be ignored. We have the entire population. We don't need the standard error mean. Okay, now for your toughest test of the day, standard deviation. Standard deviation is a term a lot of people throw around, uh, but not too many people actually understand it. And I think it's really helpful to use in context and provide context around your data and also helpful for you to understand. So without getting into the math about the standard deviation being the square root of the variance, and variance is another statistical calculation, which you don't need to know off the top of your head, the standard deviation really reflects how spread out your data is around the mean. Are your values tightly clustered to an average, um, or are they more spread out? Um, and the reason why you want to know that is it's really about consistency. So when you look at that average, you're trying to understand are there outliers or not? The median will help you that. And the standard deviation to tell you is there consistency. So in the example I gave you, the two, a lot of twos and a hundred, there's probably going to be a low standard deviation because there's a lot of consistency around those twos. Here's an example. Average contract value. It's a typical question you might get as a CFO. What's your average contract value? What's our average customer side? And so without understanding some of these detailed or descriptive statistics, you may look at your mean and say it's $25,000. This would imply that your average deal size is $25,000. But without standard deviation, you may not have an understanding if $25,000 is a typical deal size. So you can see in data set one, which is named small standard deviation, and if you look on the left of your screen, You'll, or the right of your screen, I'm sorry, left of my screen, you'll actually see the standard deviation of five, which is small. And that's telling you that your average deal size is 25,000, but there's actually only about $5,000 here that you really have to worry about in terms of clustering so that you really can feel good that your deal size is probably somewhere between 20 and $30,000. So $25,000 is a pretty good representative number of your average deal size or your average customer. If you look at data set two, you see a much higher standard deviation. That standard deviation would imply that there's a lot of variation in your deal size. And if you actually think of 25 plus or minus 17, you're looking at a deal size from 8,000 to 42,000. So it's a very different conversation if you ask me, what's my average deal size? If I tell you $25,000, you're going to assume that most deals are $25,000. Knowing a large standard deviation, I might say the average is $25,000, but my deals really vary depending on customer and type. So they typically range somewhere from eight to $42,000. And that's a much more descriptive way of telling your average deal size, which hence the term descriptive statistics. Okay, 
Now, here's some more easy ones. Obviously, part of that data is maybe you want to know your minimum, your maximum. Obviously, we talked about median and quartiles. Your minimum and maximum, you should understand what those are, your smallest and largest deals, the median we talked about. The quartiles also tell you where data falls. So again, just helpful information around that comment. So if I talk to you about an average deal size of 25,000, I can tell you, look, average is 25. In general, my deals go from eight to 42, right? I can tell you the lowest deal or the biggest deal I've had, which is gives you some context around that. Um, and I can also tell you the quartiles, which tells you how many deals are where. Okay, so before we review, I want to congratulate you for conquering your statistics anxiety. You've dealt with descriptive statistics. I'm hoping that you can use these in the future with some of your data analysis. So let's just review before I let you go. Descriptive statistics of a data set really provide you the full story. As I said at the start of this talk, most of you are probably using one or two of these descriptive statistics when you're looking at data. And the beauty of the mini tab menu is it gives you a number of descriptive statistics that really round out that full story. So do you understand that your popular is your data set a population, an entire data set, or just a sample? Do you understand if you're missing data? Do you understand the characteristics? Are you looking at both mean and median? And standard error mean if in fact you are taking a sample. Are you thinking about standard deviation, how clustered your data is or how much variance it is? And are you thinking about the minimum and maximum and the quartiles of your data? Well, I told you we're going back to basics. Hopefully you found that helpful and easy. I want to thank you for your time. And again, please comment in the chat if you have questions, comments, or if you have other topics that you want to see the statistical CFO tackle. Thanks. Looking forward to talking with you next time.